You're an interesting man. Scott Lang. Psst, hey, what does Quantum Mania mean? Shh, you've made a big mistake, okay? I'm an Avenger. I've called the other Avengers. Did someone say what Quantum Mania was and I missed it? Have I killed you before? They all blur together after a while. Am I the only one who cares about this? Okay, I will make you a deal, Kang. I'll steal your softball if you tell me why this movie was titled Quantumania. In its entire two hour and five minute runtime, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania never once says the word Quantumania. Yes, Quantumania does contain the words ant and man, and I guess it's a joke about putting quantum in front of everything, but that's not enough for me. So I drank the ooze, and translated it. I'm Eric Voss, and this is The Deep Dive. And today we are diving into Marvel's Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, directed by Peyton Reed, written by Jeff Loveness, and the first foray into Marvel's Phase 5. While packing an electrifying punch from Jonathan Majors as the MCU's new big bad Kang the Conqueror, the rest of this delightfully bizarre movie leaves us wondering what Quantumania means, what the film Quantumania means, and what the word itself means. Very you strange. have a title called Quantumania, you yeah. want to make good on it. <laughs> well, Kevin, you could start by using the word somewhere in the movie, but actually, I believe that the meaning of Quantumania is there. It's hidden in a secret connection between Lang and Kang. And thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video. I can't believe people are taking a chance on us here and sponsoring us. It means so much to us, but I'll talk more about them in a minute. This movie's wild post credit scenes airdrop us into the Kang Dynasty, but the movie itself is a story of the Lang Dynasty. The six phases of Scott Lang on his journey to truly earn his Avenger status. Our six Scots are Scott the Non-Interventionalist, Scott the Parent, Scott the Hive Mind, Scott the Conqueror, Scott the Hero, and Scott the Futurist. And by getting to know each of these Scots, we will decode what Quantumania really means. Quantumania begins as a story between Kang and Janet Van Dyne. Kang crash lands in the Quantum Realm over Janet's farm. Already the sky bears his color tones of purple and teal, and three pieces of debris break off his ship, mirroring the three other Kangs from the Kang Dynasty who sabotaged this ship to exile him here. When you look up at the portals in the sky, they're all blue, surrounded by swirls of purple, colors of the Kang Dynasty. But later, when Kang and Janet sit here, the portals are a different color. The previous color perhaps reflecting the purple sky over the dynasty that cast him out. But that dynasty didn't count on their outcast meeting an Avenger. Now the blue glowing monsters that attack Janet and Kang start as one, but split into two. A recurring visual theme in the Quantum Realm setting up Scott, splitting into his Schrodinger double in the Probability Storm. Also the Dune centipede creatures that encounter them will also start as one and split into two. We are all what whether we know it or not, the sum of our possibilities. This movie marketed itself with Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, casting the Quantum Realm as a kind of Oz, and if He Who Remains and Loki was depicted as a man behind the curtain, this is the story of the wizard's balloon landing in Oz and his attempt to reinflate that balloon to escape. You'll notice that I reference The Wizard of Oz a lot on this channel. It's because I have a working theory that every American film is trying to be one of two classic films, The Wizard of Oz or Citizen Kane, the experience of a dream or the experience of solving a puzzle or mystery. Quantumania is definitely the former. It's trying to be Oz, and so I believe it's best looked at that way. So from this prologue, we move on to Scott Lang in the first phase of his Lang dynasty, Scott the Non-Interventionalist. After Quantumania's 2018 predecessor began with the sitcom theme to the Partridge family, this one opens with the Welcome Back Cotter theme, which was a sitcom about a comedian who returns to teach at a Brooklyn high school where John Travolta would get his breakout role. Let's look at the song's lyrics. Welcome back, your dreams were your ticket out. Welcome back to that same old place you laughed about. Well, the names have all changed since you hung around, but those dreams have remained and they've turned around. In Ant-Man and the Wasp, Scott had dreams of Janet in the quantum realm. This song reflects his path forward to go back to the place he escaped, where the names have changed. And among the sweat hogs waiting for him is the breakout Vinny Barbarino. Scott references time traveling with Captain America, alluding to when he helped the Avengers in Endgame manipulate time to undo Thanos' snap. Scott, reading from his memoir, says none of this should have happened acknowledging the violation that his current dream life represents. From being fired from Baskin Robbins to now being honored as employee of the century, Ruben in the cafe covering his coffee and saying, Thank you, Spider-Man. Yeah, in fairness, no one knows who Spider-Man really is anymore after that memory wipe spell. Scott's now the best-selling author of Look Out for the Little Guy, a memoir. He reads to fans at a bookstore saying, There's always room to grow. An obvious nod of the way Scott and the Ant family combat Kang in this movie, from oversizing the energy core beyond use to growing big to stop Kang from escaping. But how Having published a memoir suggests that Scott's adventures are over.
over, like Bilbo Baggins writing There and Back Again. Scott is happy in retirement. Having seen life from both sides now is an important dimension for the overall Lang dynasty, but there's still something broken in Scott's life, that feeling of having missed out on his daughter Cassie's life. Which brings us to phase two of the Lang dynasty, Scott the parent. His daughter Cassie reflects both Ant-Mans. She begins her journey behind bars, the way Scott does in the 2015 Ant-Man film, but she shrunk a police car. Hank Pym, the previous Ant-Man, shrunk a Soviet tank that he kept on his keychain in that 2015 film. Scott and Cassie have this father-daughter chat. I know how to take care of myself, okay? Trust me, I'm pretty good at it by now. Ouch. Look, I didn't mean it like that. I'm no, sorry. It's okay. It's all right. I just think you should get to have a normal life. Dad, a guy dressed like a bee tried to kill me in my room when I was six. I've never had a normal life. Cassie reminds us how Darren Cross tried to kill her before Scott shrunk his body parts to turn him into the form he is in this movie. They're driving through San Francisco's Union Square. I have shopped at that Macy's and I can tell you, the film production definitely would have had to clear some homeless people from this exterior shot. It's a shame that I look at all movies this way and I always think about this stuff. Like they literally had to tell people, move, we have to make a Marvel movie. Hey, psst, Mayor, London Breed, did you turn that empty Salesforce tower into some public housing? Thanks. This is all just a bit ironic considering Cassie was protesting cops clearing a homeless encampment. Anyway, Cassie clarifies that these homeless people lost their homes in the blip, referring to the people Hulk brought back to find their homes occupied by other people. The point here is Scott isn't really fully accepting responsibility for the impact that he and Banner and the rest left by saving everyone in Endgame. Scott is happy to just let Hope and Cassie do all the cleanup while he goes on his book tour, which we hear from again here. Am I the Hulk's baby? Dad, are you listening to your own book? But I was ready for anything. Hmm? No, that's, uh, Steve this and I is the radio. Over that. <laughs> turn it it's off. It's so weird. Oh. Something's wrong with this switch. It won't turn I off. I said turn it off. What's that? Turn it up. All right. Yeah, Scott messing around with that radio switch not turning off, foreshadowing Cassie's quantum radio not turning off when it absorbs all of them into the quantum realm. Hank uses old school pimp articles to enlarge a pizza, invoking the family pizza scene in Back to the Future 2's 2015 sequence. Back to the Future's time travel logic was referenced by Scott in Endgame. So Back to the Future is a bunch of bullshit. Next week on this channel, I will be doing a deep dive into 1985's Back to the Future, and you're gonna love it. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that bell icon to get notified when it drops. Notice how Hank in the scene has his hearing aid visible, which will prove critical later in this movie when he gets his frequency entangled with the super smart ants. Quantum communication, transitioning from a singular mind to a hive mind. What's good for the collective is the key to this story, and the ants are the facilitators of it. We see these ants right away when the family enters the lab, with Scott observing the ant farm. Each of the ants have helmets with glowing green lights, and already there are complex little structures that they're building. This is our first hint to the cure to quantumania, which I believe this movie implicitly defines as Quantumania. Now, a state of shock or confusion when one's consciousness drifts from a singular perspective into a shared hive colony as a result of multiversal quantum entanglement. This is my definition, not anything the movie explicitly states, but I think it helps us understand this film and why Lang and Kang are perfect opposites. I'll talk more on this as I go, but these ants are the cure to Scott's mania. As Cassie shows them her quantum satellite communicator, lying around the desk are books about ants that Hank had been researching Dr. Eleanor's Common Ants of California, and Journey to the Ants by Bert Holdobler and Richard O. Wilson. So the ants of this movie aren't just an afterthought holdover of the superhero moniker. When the family gets sucked into the quantum realm, one of the first things Scott bumps into on the way down is that ant farm, which enlarges at a different rate to show the ants spiraling off on a different trajectory. Hank, Janet, Hope, Cassie, and Scott all tumble down, crashing through the same barrier wall as the crystalline membrane that Hank had to pass through in the 2018 film to officially enter a separate realm, the quantum realm. Now, I like that when they initially get drawn in, Hope instinctively makes the choice to suit up and go after her parents. She could have stayed and tried to help from outside, but she is already steps ahead of Scott on that Avengers pipeline. Scott suits up with his new slap-on chest piece, enlarges, and catches Cassie in his hands. And Cassie, hinting that she has her own suit that she knows how to work, punches the button on Scott's glove to shrink them back down. A key lesson for every parent, if you have technology, your kid is gonna figure out how to use it better than you can. And even in this Avenger crisis, Scott relates to this as a parent would. It's like we're camping. We've never been camping. But we've always talked about it. So Scott and Cassie are taken to the Freedom Fighter camp like Han Solo and his friends initially brought to the Ewok camp and returned to the Jedi. Cassie tells him to drink the ooze so that he'll understand them. And we meet Veb, the character voiced by David Dasmalchian, who played Kurt in the past films. Hello. Uh. We also meet Quaz the telepath, played by William Jackson Harper, and they wonder how many holes Scott has. How many holes do you have? He has seven holes. <gasps> 
Yeah, that's, that's right. I love the meta joke here. It's kind of like Scott using telepathy of his own to connect with us, to tell how long it would take us to count to our seven holes of our head. Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This whole idea of the holes in one's body sets up Beb getting shot full of holes later on. And I love how if you look closely in this moment, Beb's eyes go really wide upon hearing of all Scott's holes. Like what this thing craves more than anything is a bunch of holes he can use in his body. He wants to have this many holes so that he can merge them all into one hole and grow large and Kirby his enemies. Again, this idea of out of many, one. Out of many holes, one big hole. Out of many variants, one big strong collective. So structurally, Scott is transitioning into the next phase of his Lang dynasty, the hive mind, but he's not there yet. He spent the first part of this movie with terrible communication, hearing pretty much exclusively his own inner monologue. Literally his own voice through his audiobook playing back through the car. So that even without the language barrier with these people in the quantum realm, he has just in general been struggling to hear other people like his daughter. So he must transform himself by consuming assuming Veb's ooze to become part of the tribe. And it's kind of beautiful that this tribe was, in effect, chanting in celebration to have someone new to communicate with. Drink the ooze, drink the ooze. It's not a threatening chant, it's essentially one of us one of us. And I love that about them. Now this group is led by Jen Tora, Katie O'Brien, who says, You come from above, like him. This suggests that Jen Tora sees Kang and other macro dwellers like Scott as a kind of god, but not gods that she looks up to, gods that she hates, gods who come to destroy. Extrapolate that to our frame of reference. By extension, the MCU reality sees celestials the same way, and they may come from a dimension beyond the atoms of our planets and galaxies. <laughs> Meanwhile, Janet meets a tribe in this dune-like desert region, and she gets his riding creature flying with Hank and Hope to the city of Axia, and they land at this port. Yeah, we hear that quantum language over the PA. We're unable to translate it right now because Hank and Hope have not drank their ooze yet. And this is something we only noticed because we just went through this with Scott. Hank says, The subatomic universe. This changes everything we know about life, evolution, our place in the galaxy. Holy that guy looks like broccoli. Now you'd think Hank's mind would have already been blown by, you know, aliens and celestials. Duh, dude, MCU Terrans aren't exceptional, we know. But really, it's just the next steps from our reality that are harder to comprehend. Janet takes them to this bar in Axia, which she accesses through a door that's structured in concentric circles. This is a production design detail that I really like about Quantumania. Everything is circle-based. Like there's a circle-based written language that shows up throughout Axia, and perhaps most interestingly, on the bands of Kang's core device. That tells us that this language came from Kang and from the multiverse, and trickled down into the culture of the quantum realm the way historically conquering invaders dominate cultures by forcing the locals to adopt their language. Kang sees time as a flat circle, and it's just interesting that circles even form his written code. This is a lot like the movie Arrival, a movie that I love and I hope to deep dive into at some point on this channel. The heptopod aliens that are unstuck from time have a written language that takes the form of a circle to represent the way that they see time cyclically. And we meet Lord Krylar, Bill Murray, who stalls them to turn them into Kang, kinda like Lando on Cloud City and Empire. Yeah, there's a couple like Star Wars parallels in this movie. But when they break away, Hank spots one of those little squids, you know, Krylar's favorite food, and the squid waves at Hank. He waves goodbye. And so Hank gives him a parting gift by enlarging him. Though I find it fascinating that this giant creature does not eat Krylar. It's just nice to see that unlike Kang, not everything in the quantum realm thinks in terms of vengeance and zero sum games. Or maybe it was just Bill Murray was like, yeah, I'll be in your stupid movie, but I won't have a stupid death. Now, Gentura says that the Conqueror quote, burned our homes, our stories. Which is an interesting line, because Jintora is basically saying Kang destroyed their history and their culture, and since their buildings are living creatures, these walls really can talk. It's the same idea of Kang burning his enemies out of time, as he says later. He uproots and prunes his victims' timelines. He burns their stories. And we see the Hunter, the mechanized organism designed only for killing, of course referring to MODOK. But unlike the comic version of MODOK, which is George Tarleton, has a whole other different story, the MCU has retconned him to be Darren Cross from the first Ant-Man movie, whose body was disproportionately shrunk into the quantum realm. So let us pause briefly to talk about MODOK in this movie. Why is MODOK in this movie? I will admit that he sticks out as the ugliest sore thumb that I've ever seen in a Marvel film. But remember, Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz. This is an Alice in Wonderland Wizard of Oz story. It's a dream of a film. And this kind of story just would not be complete without some distorted face from the waking life. So it's not just that they make Corey Stoll's head huge, they also smush his face in a weird way. And they use this character as proof that no monster in the multiverse is beyond redemption. Still, 
having to look at this guy so much in the movie, bleh. So Janet finally reveals to Hope and Hank her history with Kang. In the flashback, Janet tells Kang about the last time she saw Hope, which we saw in the 2018 film prologue, and Kang says, time, it's not what you think it is. It's a cage. It does everything it can to break you. It's not until you free yourself from it that you see just how small it always was. And what I love about Jonathan Major's delivery in this part is how understated and how small he plays it. He is a sociopath playing a part to win over Janet. It's all deceptive, because when Janet later learns that he's Kang the Conqueror and he restores his suit, he vocalizes the same words, but with a loftier affect, revealing how he was totally playing her. It isn't what you think. I told you, time, it isn't what you think. Ha 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 Now in this flashback, they were trying to reactivate Kang's multiversal engine core, which looks like a sphere with layered bands that rotate. And I love the circular design of all this. Kang sees time as a circle, and a sphere, by definition, is infinite circles stacked on the same radial center. A sphere itself is literally the representation of infinite sacred timelines orbiting themselves. And to use two Robert Zemeckis references here, it's kind of like the wormhole engine that we see in Contact, and the flux capacitor Back to the Future, the one mysterious unexplained MacGuffin that makes it all possible. Now, at the beginning, of this deep dive, I mentioned how big a deal it is that people even want to sponsor us here on Deep Dive Video since we're a new channel. So a huge thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring this deep dive. So Marvel movies have big budgets, which sounds nice, right? If you want a big budget for your life, Rocket Money can help with that. It's what makes saving money easy. Rocket Money is my favorite all-in-one finance app. It helps me manage my expenses and save hundreds. One of Rocket Money's best features is that it helps you find and cancel all your unwanted subscriptions. I was wasting hundreds of dollars every month on stuff I don't even use, and now I can use Rocket Money's smart savings account to put that money aside instead. I just choose the amount I want to save and how frequently Rocket Money automatically deposits my money into a savings fund that I can withdraw from any time. For the money I'm spending, instead of saving, I use the budgeting tool. It monitors my spending by category, sends notifications when I've exceeded my spending limits, and visualizes my spend-to-earn ratio by month, quarter, or year. Rocket Money can even negotiate bills, from internet service bills to cable and phone bills. I didn't even know those could be negotiated. Just upload a photo of your bill and Rocket Money does the rest. Once you've signed up for free, you can unlock even more features with premium. It's so easy to use that there's no reason not to take control of your finances. To try Rocket Money out and support this deep dive channel, head to rocketmoney.com slash new rockstars or click the link in the video description. As Janet makes contact with the neurokinetic engine, we briefly see some sacred timeline imagery from Loki, except this time, the timeline explodes, torn to pieces. And then within one of those timelines, Kang vaporizes, fleeing victims. It looks like a burnt out forest. Now this is just a tangible example of Kang's violence, but what Janet is referring to is something on a more macro scale. Kang stores in his memory entire world histories that he erased from existence. The only memory of them are in the scars that he carries with him. He and the rest of the Kang dynasty have been so successful in their genocide that they erased their own existence from the record that we know. And that's why until now, no one has heard the name Kang. And I like how we see the eyes and the lines on his face lighting up up as he does this. This could be where he stores these memories and why he has these scars. The mystery of Kang's scars. This could be a representation of the scar tissue of every sacred timeline that he has torn to pieces. The trillions of lives he has destroyed. Evidence of him carrying this pain with him. I like how the first time Kang is said out loud in the MCU, it's Janet at this moment asking, who is Kang? It's a question. Kang's response, who I need to be. Janet asks what Kang will do when he gets out, and he simply responds, win and he reactivates his suit and his ship. But Janet snatches the core, and on a dime, Kang completely obliterates her house. She said it was ages that they worked together, ages of a friendship destroyed in an instant. That's what you get when you befriend a Kang. The robes that Janet was wearing are now gone to show that underneath it all, she was still wearing that red and black 80s wasp suit. She's back in Avenger mode, and Janet uses PIM discs to blow up the core beyond use. So now we know practically why Kang needs Lang, to shrink the core so that it can be used. But really, Kang is manipulating the fact that Janet Janet, in her guilt, would have never told the family about him. So Kang can use the same offer on Scott that he used with Janet, the promise to give him back time with a daughter. Now Major's performance is chilling in this scene. You've made a big mistake, okay? I'm an Avenger. I've called the other Avengers. You're an Avenger. Have I killed you before? <laughs> what? They all blur together after a while. Yeah, Kang isn't actively trying to scare Scott. He has conquered so many timelines, the Avengers are all faceless to him. This includes Thor, the one with the hammer, he says. Kang reminds him that he doesn't live in a straight line, that he knows how all of time ends, and he knows what's coming. Me, a lot of me, they exiled me down here. They're afraid of me. If you think about it, he is echoing his variant, he remains in Loki. If you think I'm evil, well, 
Just wait till you meet my variants. We are seeing the darker side of Quantumania as a sickness. All Kangs fear each other. Now Majors as an actor described his portrayal of Kang as quote, no moves wasted. And you can definitely see that here when Kang merely folds his fingers to pull Scott toward the barrier wall and then slam him against the back wall and then to lift and torture Cassie behind his back. Majors also said that he took inspiration from great conquerors of history, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great. And you can see that full history of ego flowing through his gravitas. The rage of Genghis Khan, the betrayal of Julius Caesar and of Alexander the Great, the weeping upon having no worlds left to conquer. Kang opens a portal to the wreckage of his blown up multiversal engine core, and Scott shrinks down into that core, and we enter the next phase of the Lang Dynasty, Scott the Hive Mind, as Scott finds himself in a probability storm of variants representing every choice he could ever make all at once. Modok says he's in Schrodinger's box, and he's the cat, a reference to the famous thought experiment of Erwin Schrodinger, who postulated the existence of a multiverse with the example of a cat in a box, and two food dishes, one containing food, the other poison, and that so long as the lid of the box stays closed, the cat is simultaneously both alive and dead. Notice how the first variant to split off from Scott occurs right as Scott steps toward the core, and his variant turns and steps in the opposite direction to retreat. So this first variant represents Scott's cowardice, running from danger. But that also liberates our Scott, because he no longer has the baggage of his most crippling fear to weigh him down and pull him in the opposite direction. In a way, this makes Scott more heroic. And now, of course, one of the variants is himself from Baskin Robbins, the Scott that never got fired and never became an Avenger. Off screen, you can definitely hear one of the others asking if he has ice cream. Throughout this chaotic scene, they make a smart choice of having our Scott be the only one who doesn't raise his helmet. Again, he's the most courageous one. This makes him really the only Scott who never gets afraid. These other Scots all suffer from Quantumania sickness, but he is able to resist falling into that trap. Scott does get buried, but Cassie calls out to him, and the other Scots get the message too, and all work together to lift Scott up. They are not competitive. They know that he is the one they need to lift. And so we see how Scott ultimately resists the threat of Quantumania by learning to sync with his hive mind. He adopts the teamwork of an ant colony. Their shared love of Cassie is what collapses all Scots back into one. And remember, that includes his initial fear, because part of being a parent is fear that something will happen to your kid. Once they shrink down the core, Janet begs Scott not to trust Kang, and Kang looks over at Hope and says, Hello, Jelly Bean showing us that he remembers everything Janet told him about her. Kang snatches a core, and Scott and Hope shrink to charge at him. Behind them, notice how Janet already looks defeated. She knows Kang is strong enough to repel them, which he does with a no-moves-wasted flick of his fingers. Now later, Kang clarifies to Janet what she saw. Time, broken by every version of himself. Variants throughout the multiverse playing with time like children. He says, I saw chaos spreading across realities, universes colliding, endless incursions. I saw the multiverse and it was dying, all because of them. Kang projects a glowing blue ring over his palm, and the sacred timeline imagery returns, orbiting around them, with branches snaking off. What he remains saw around his citadel, this Kang has also seen. He also uses the term incursions, the term Reed Richards used in Multiverse of Madness for universes colliding, which is what will lead to Avengers Secret Wars. This speech bridges the visual logic of Loki and Multiverse of Madness, but we also see what incursions look like from a macro scale. Two sacred timeline rings, one ring atop the other, just like the way he remains depicted the multiverse in his backstory. But here, with branches snaking down and causing these little bursts of light, one universe competing with another universe, secret wars, and action. Now, one could argue this Kang was the one good Kang trying to stop the rest of the dynasty from killing the multiverse. But one could also make that argument about any Kang. Their vanity is the inability to see the role of their own meddling in that overall destruction. Janet says, you started a war, and now you want to wipe away any universe that's a threat to you? That's what monsters do. So it sounds like this Kang was the one who initially started that multiversal war that he remains referred to in Loki. Not every version of me was so, so pure of heart. Some of us, new worlds meant only one thing, new lands to be conquered. The peace between realities <laughs> erupted into all out war. Each variant fighting to preserve their universe and annihilate the others. But Kang defends his actions, saying, that's what conquerors do. They burn the broken world, and they make a new one. Kang is both the victim and the perpetrator of a self-fulfilling prophecy. He's fixing the mess that he started. He's unable to see what he did to start the fire, and it was always burning since the multiverse was turning. Kang snaps, I have lost. You have no idea what I've lost. And I will burn them out of time. So what did Kang lose? We must assume Ren Slayer, his great love, but I think more than that, he's lost his own peace of mind, and he blames the other Kangs for making him eternally paranoid. Quantum mania. 
Hank reveals that his ants found him. They aged a thousand years in a single day and developed science to build a class two technocratic civilization, hinting that it's socialism, but really a technocracy is a government led by technological experts. And either way, it tells us that this colony overthrew its queen and it gives them a strategic advantage over Kang's obsolete military dictatorship. Scott, now empowered with the battle strategy of Hank's ants, manages to weaponize his quantum mania and enter the next phase of the Lang dynasty, Scott the Conqueror. Giant Scott rampages through Kang's fortress city to draw out Kang's fleet and to try to wedge open Kang's shield. Essentially, Hank and the ants gave Scott the advice that Cap gave Hulk. And Hulk, <sighs> smash. If Kang wasn't so greedy, trying to escape with his entire fleet and his armada, he would have been able to escape just in that chair pod. But because he was so afraid of the rest of the dynasty, it took him too long to escape and gave Scott enough time to take him down. Among the backup are the Freedom Fighters, including their sentient buildings, which for Kang must evoke Shakespeare's Macbeth. When a besieged Macbeth sees the witch's prophecy of the trees come to life to kill him. Shakespeare's all over Major's work in this movie. He who remains was the immortal fairy Puck from Midsummer Night's Dream, the betrayed conqueror of Act Two was Julius Caesar, and now he is the paranoid King Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Scott slams into Kang's rings using a giant disc as a shield and a wedge. After Captain America has come a few times in this film, Scott reminds us that he's still on Team Cap by cosplaying with his own Cap shield. Scott, Hope, and Cassie confront Kang together, and Kang beats him down, mocking Scott by saying, you talk to ants. But that is Scott's secret weapon, as Hank leads a Rohirrim charge of ants through the gate to swarm Kang, and with the help of Darren not wanting to be a dick anymore, break through his shield. Darren says he dies an Avenger, and Scott's not quite sure. But beyond the joke, Scott truly isn't an Avenger yet, because he still has a couple Lang Dynasty phases, as Hank, Janet, and Hope exit through the portal, Kang repels Scott, and Scott shifts into Scott the Hero. Now, what's the difference between a conqueror and a hero? Well, a hero isn't trying to win. A hero is just trying to save others from harm, even if that means dooming himself. And you're not getting out. You thought you could win. I have to win. We both just have to lose. That heroic selflessness also applies to Hope, who makes her second voluntary leap into the quantum realm to help Scott defeat Kang, throwing a mix of red and blue discs to cause the core to chaotically size up and down and suck Kang into the vortex. While his dynasty assumes his exile is dead, this is essentially what we saw happen to Darren Cross. Presumably, this Kang could be stuck in the probability storm, trapped with countless Schrodinger duplicates, and might finally figure out the cure to his own quantumania the way Scott did. For Scott, the voice that he needed to hear was Cassie. So what voice does Kang need to hear? I believe the queen of his high red. Slayer. And this movie ends where it began. Scott back in San Francisco set to the Welcome Back Cotter theme. But creepily, it feels like we are restarting a loop. Like we're seeing another sacred timeline playing out from the vantage point of another Kang. Scott fears as much as his world goes dark. He also said something bad was coming and that everyone would die if he didn't get out. So did I just kill everyone? Is everyone going to die because of me? Oh God, what did I do? What's interesting about this is in the opening montage, this narration was justified to be Scott's audiobook. So what is this narration now? Is Scott writing a new book? Is someone else writing a book using Scott? Scott's voice? We don't really know, and that's kind of why it's so unsettling. And during this epilogue, Scott zeroes in on a few passersby who wear a specific shade of purple. Like at any moment, Kang's purple robes or Modok's fuchsia beams could pop out and disintegrate him. Scott snaps out of it, telling himself to stop overthinking it. But even during Cassie's birthday party, he cannot keep that looming threat of the Kang Dynasty from living rent-free in his head. This movie's post credit scenes show that threat realized, the Kang Dynasty, and one of Kang's earlier forms, Victor Timely, whom we'll explore in Loki Season 2. Arguably, Victor is even scarier. A Kang as a 1901 inventor hidden among our society the whole time under our noses? With the name Timely, the original name of Marvel Comics? He's the author of all of our pain. This fear is the final phase of the Lang Dynasty, Scott the Futurist. We are, after all, on a journey to make Scott earn his Avenger status, and no Avenger trial is complete without an unhealthy fear of the future. That was the defining feature of the most famous Avenger, Tony Stark. In fact, all of the phases of the Lang Dynasty mirror the six OG Avengers. Scott the non-interventionalist was the pacifist Bruce Banner, for a good Avenger must know when to pull his punches. Scott the parent was the family man Clint Barton, for Avengers need a family to fight for. Scott the hive mind was the one other OG Avenger named after a bug, Black Widow, as Natasha's strength comes from her Red Room intuition and her trust in others. Scott the conqueror, obviously Thor, because Avengering sometimes requires big boy boom booms. Scott the hero, Steve Rogers, because Avengers have to be willing to jump on a grenade or crash their plane to save lives. Which brings us to Scott the Futurist, Tony Stark, who was defined by his paranoia over future threats. Thanos saw this in him. You're not the only one cursed with knowledge. And this futurism is what led Tony to, despite his retirement, continue to tinker with inverted Mobius strips and unlock the code of time travel, which might have been a fateful mistake because it was this technology that Kang would later build on to build his multiversal core. That fear is what started all of this, as Tony warned us in Endgame. You mess with time, it tends to mess back. 
That was the moment Marvel promised us Kang would be coming next. Yet this dynasty remains plagued by Quantumania, a fear and misunderstanding of one's variants, a tendency to scream over each other until they're hoarse and deaf and the multiverse is in shambles. So the Avengers can win if Scott Lang can teach them how to love their multiversal hives, or even better, if the Avengers can teach Kang how to do this. Thank you so much for joining me in this deep dive of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Next week, we're going back to the nexus point of time travel cinema with a deep dive of 1985's Back to the Future, and no, Scott Lang, it's not a bunch of bullshit. The best way to support this deep dive channel is to buy a deep dive shirt or a hoodie, a hat, a mug, a water bottle from our merch store, nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to the deep dive, turn on notifications, follow deep dive NR on all social media. You can follow my personal socials at EA Voss. Also subscribe to New Rockstars, where you can find my classic Easter egg breakdown of Quantumania. I didn't cover an Easter egg in this, it's in that video. And I will see you further down that yellow brick road, my divers of the deep. Thank you.